the most powerful appetite suppressant is actually in our food. And it makes sense because the body's always trying to gauge when we get enough adequate nutrition in. If we got adequate nutrition, then the body would probably shut down some of the hunger cues. It just makes sense. Hey, you're nourished. You don't need to eat anymore. I'm going to come right out and tell you what it is because I want you to learn it right up front. And then we can go through the education on how to use it. It's calcium. Now, I do want you to stick with me because there's some caveats. Like I've done other videos talking about how excess calcium in supplement form can be problematic for like atherosclerosis and cardiovascular issues. So we kind of want to thread that needle carefully. Also, if you can drop a comment down below, it does help the algorithm out. So even if it's just a thank you or, hey, I enjoy your content, it really just helps get the video out to the right people. So now that you know it's calcium, you may want to click off, but we're going to talk about how this works. So think of it as like your body's way of saying, hey, if I get enough calcium, it means I probably got enough protein in a natural sense, or I probably got enough of what is required for proper vitamin D utilization and all kinds of other things. But it does go a little bit further beyond that. We're going to talk about how it influences appetite, how it actually directly influences fat loss and even insulin. So calcium is a really interesting thing because we should be getting it from our food, but unfortunately we do end up supplementing with it or getting fortified foods because we're just not getting it in our actual food. But it goes beyond just that. So let's dive into it. After today's video, I put a link for our sponsor, which is Haya Kids Multivitamin. So if you got kids and you're having a hard time getting them to eat everything that they need to eat, which is just the way that it is, I highly recommend this Haya Multivitamin that's sweetened with monk fruit. So it doesn't have hidden nastiness in it. It's not like a gummy with a bunch of sugar or something like that. It's just a good old fashioned kids multivitamin that is tailored for kids to instill a good habit and something that's kind of a fun ritual. Like my kids enjoy having it pretty much every night, right? And they've got a couple other different varieties which are really cool too. So that link is 50% off. If you got kiddos, it's worth taking a look at. 50% off your entire first order from Haya Multivitamin. I wanna open up with this initial study that was kind of interesting. And it was a human model study and it was published in the Proceedings of the Nutrition Society. Interesting because it looked at how calcium influenced actual appetite. What they did is they gave subjects in the study a regular breakfast and they gave them a breakfast with orange juice in this case. And then they gave the other group breakfast with orange juice. But in that orange juice, there was 500 milligrams of calcium just sort of snuck in there. It's kind of interesting. They measured their hunger responses and appetite every 30 minutes for a few hours after that. And what they found was really, really interesting. They found that subjectively hunger decreased significantly more in the group that had calcium. So they just were less hungry, wanted to munch less. But where the proof really stood out was that when it came down to lunchtime, the group that had the calcium consumed on average 116 calories less at lunch. That's not a little bit. That's quite a bit. And that was just the average. There were some that consumed significantly less than that. So we're talking a big difference just by having calcium with breakfast. So let's unpack it a little bit more and look at a longer study. This study was published in the journal Nutrition, and it took a look at people that went on a 22 week weight loss journey. So they lost weight over the course of 22 weeks. And what they wanted to measure was if calcium would influence the amount of weight that was regained after this. So at six and 18 months, they did follow-ups to see who had regained weight. And what they found is that those that ended up taking in more dietary calcium significantly regained less weight. So the more calcium people consumed, the less appetite they had and the less weight they regained after weight loss. What was even more crazy was they found that calcium reduced the effect of greater intake. What that meant is that it didn't just cause them to eat less, it actually diminished how the body was negatively affected by extra calories. So if they did start to eat more, it actually encouraged the body to burn more and increase sort of a metabolic rate and a turnover in this case. So let's talk about how the lipolysis piece works. Now, a quick takeaway on this part, like just kind of speaking truthfully, I wanna give you little chunks as we go. I think that's a nice way to do it. What we're learning from this particular study and the one right before it is that it's best to have your calcium with breakfast. That way you're having this sort of carryover throughout the day and the body feels like, hey, I don't need to eat as much throughout the course of the day. And I recommend starting small. 500 milligrams of calcium is fine. Better yet, if you could get calcium, you're not gonna hate this because it kind of sounds nasty, but something like sardines that have the bone in them, like that's the real way to get calcium in a full spectrum form. Unopposed calcium with just the solo mineral, Eh, like especially if you're dealing with you know cardiac risk factors you may want to 
reconsider like going high amounts in calcium supplements. I've done videos on that, but anyhow, let's keep moving on. So breakfast is when you wanna do it, 500 milligrams to start. There was a study that was published in FASEB journal that was looking at the lipolysis link with calcium. I found this particularly fascinating. It was looking at the link between intracellular calcium, which is slightly different, I'll explain in a minute, vitamin D or calcitriol, and overall like fat loss. Now this study was done on mice, but it was to try to understand the mechanistic details of like what we learned in the human model studies. What they found with this is that mice that were given a low calcium plus a high fat, high sugar diet, in essence, to try to gain weight, what they found is that their levels of intracellular calcium went up. So in a low dietary calcium state, the fat cell actually soaks up more calcium. Probably does it as somewhat of a reserve, but we noticed that it soaks up more calcium. But in addition to this, they of course saw their body weight increase and they had a two times increase in their overall fat pad mass. Also, of course, that 2x increase in calcium in the fat cell. So more calories with low calcium meant more calcium sequestered into a fat cell. Well, what does that do exactly? A lot of it we don't know. What we do know is that there's also an inverse correlation the other way. So if dietary calcium is high, it, and I quote from the researchers, markedly reduced calcium in a fat cell. So what it tells us is when we have more calcium coming in, we have less calcium in a fat cell. When we have less calcium coming into the diet, we have more calcium in the actual fat cell itself. Now, we know that this can have an impact on insulin. It can actually affect the insulin receptor, which we'll talk about in a little bit, but it also might just slow down lipolysis in the first place. So what do I mean by that? Well, what we found is that a high calcium diet leads to a 35 to 63% decrease in fatty acid synthase. So if intracellular calcium is low and dietary calcium is high, there's less of the enzyme that actually builds new fat, fatty acid synthase. So we know that calcium, even in the short term, but mostly in the long term, is preventing fatty acids from actually being built in the first place, which makes it a lot harder to regain weight. It explains that other study. But what's really cool is there is a two to three X increase in lipolysis and a two X increase in uncoupling, which means the body was creating more brown fat and dissipating energy as heat. And there was overall just a two X to three X increase in fatty acid burning in the first place in lipolysis. So we're burning fat, we're slowing down the storage of fat and we're reducing appetite. Okay, why isn't everyone just popping calcium like mad? Well, because it's complicated to explain. And when you do look at the literature, it is quite strong, but we need to understand more on the appetite piece. So just again, recap as we go, you wanna have calcium in the morning, about 500 milligrams, but you also wanna be paying attention to your dietary calcium and get yourself probably 1500 or so milligrams of calcium more than what you normally would do, maybe through dairy or yogurt or something, and you might start to find that your fat burning increases. We used to think it was much more about the CLA, the conjugated linoleic acid, that's in milk, but maybe it's more so about the calcium that's in dairy products. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay, so for the next part to make sense surrounding leptin and appetite, I'm gonna recap really quick mechanistically what happens. You eat more calcium, it reduces what's called calcitriol, okay, which therefore reduces stored calcium in the fat cell. When you have lower calcium in the fat cell, you have the decrease in fatty acid synthase, the increase in hormone sensitive lipase, essentially more lipolysis, more fat cells, breaking down or triglycerides breaking down and releasing fat cells. Once that happens, you now go from a bigger fat cell to a smaller fat cell. When a smaller fat cell secretes what's called leptin, it secretes less. Now, what is leptin? Leptin is commonly known as the hunger or satiety hormone, right? It's a satiety hormone because when it's secreted, it should make us feel full, right? So it sounds kind of weird. Like, don't you want more of it to be secreted? Problem is, is that most overweight people are leptin resistant. I've probably talked about that too many times. You may be familiar with it, but leptin resistance is where you're essentially, essentially resistant to the satiety hormone because it's been pumped out by your fat cells so much. So it happens commonly with overweight people. When that fat cell shrinks, it actually reduces the amount of leptin that is secreted, which therefore gives the brain and the cells a break from being bombarded with leptin. So leptin resistance actually goes down. In other words, the fat cells are no longer barking at the brain so much that the brain tunes it out. So now the brain starts to listen to the cells more. The brain and the fat cells are now talking exactly what we want. It's like you got, you know, a divorced couple or, or they're recently separated and they don't want to talk to each other, but things need to be handled. You know, now you've got them talking. 
step one, right? Maybe it's not a good conversation, but at least they're talking and you can get somewhere. It's kind of that. It's like the brain is not wanting to listen to leptin and leptin's like, come on, come on, come on. And finally the brain's like, okay, I'll listen. Step one, right? But what this can do is this also lowers the inflammatory responses surrounding the hypothalamus. So the hypothalamus just starts to function better. Long story short, you start to get homeostasis back in these hunger cues, which is great because that's exactly what overweight people deal with is they're unable to really get the right cue from their fat cells and they don't get the hunger cues properly. But then there's one other really important piece. Okay, This is surrounding the world of insulin. This is what's super fascinating because a lot of overweight people are also insulin resistant. People don't realize that insulin actually enters the brain and suppresses arexigenic neurons. Those are the ones that usually make you want to eat. It suppresses those and it chills the brain out. So insulin going into the brain actually makes your brain want less food and it actually stimulates these satiety neurons. So from an electrical system, the brain actually becomes more satiated. The problem is if you're insulin resistant, how does this actually get to the brain? So you're not actually getting the true insulin satiety impact from food because it's resistant to it. Well, there's a study that was published in Hypertension that was a four week study looking at insulin resistant participants with calcium. It was interesting. They gave all participants a standard diet with 500 milligrams of calcium supplementation. And then after four weeks, they put them on an eight week supplementary protocol where they would still go standard diet, but they gave them either placebo or 1500 milligrams of calcium. In this case, those that had the 1500 milligrams of calcium, but not the placebo group, had improvements in insulin resistance and significant increase in insulin sensitivity and overall lower fasting insulin levels altogether. So their insulin levels went down and they got more insulin sensitive. Why was this happening? Because like I mentioned earlier, higher intake of calcium leads to lower calcium in a fat cell. Now when that cell, in a cell in general, not just a fat cell, but intracellular calcium, when that intracellular calcium is lower, then insulin receptors are able to receive a signal from insulin better. So it directly was impacting insulin signaling, making it so that, well, the body was A, able to release fatty acids better, but B, able to control appetite more, so or manage your appetite. So what is the ultimate takeaway from this? The number one thing that you need to learn with this is that calcium should be used in the morning. A lot of people take calcium with their supplements at night. If you want to get any benefit from your calcium, it's going to be taken in the morning. Okay. Now, additionally, beyond just the taking it in the morning, you want to titrate your dose in a 500 milligram initial dose and then 250 milligrams thereafter. If you are sedentary, I would not increase your calcium above 1500 milligrams. That's a lot. And I would do everything you can to get your calcium from whole food sources. One of the things that I recommend is when you make eggs, this sounds crazy, but take like half of the eggshell and just mash it into your eggs. I mean, it's a little crunchy, but if you're having four or five eggs and you do a half an eggshell, you're going to get a significant amount of calcium in a truly bioavailable form. Okay. Now I'm not saying that you're designed to eat the whole egg like that, but the food matrix matters. And when you have, again, like I mentioned, unopposed calcium, calcium, that's when you start to run into issues. Calcium is part of a complex food matrix with vitamin D, all these other kind of even vitamin A to a degree and how it's synthesized really matters. So there's even some evidence that supports that having calcium with sun exposure is going to be better. So I'm always cautious with calcium supplements because you can go overboard. It's not like it's going to make it a problem tomorrow, but it can make it a problem 10 years from now. But if you get the weight off of you, I would argue that having a little more calcium is probably a net positive. But again, dietary calcium over supplements. But if you have to start with a supplement, 500 milligrams in the morning. I'll see you tomorrow.